And good morning, good afternoon, good evening once again, and welcome to another installment of AJS 230, The Police Function. This week we're going to be talking about computers, technology, and criminalistics in policing, or more to the point, how those particular technologies have served to change policing. Now with that said, I'm reminded of a quote that came from one of our professors back in, in the days of undergrad. This particular individual was a former Detroit police inspector who later went on get, to get his PhD and later he became the president of the college. He told us it's not a question of if police are going to get computers, but rather when. And this is back in the mid to early 80s. Today, every law enforcement agency has, has computers and uses them in everyday business. Now, one of those examples of which is, is what you see right here in this photograph. This, photo, this is a computer-aided scanning device used to, get, to obtain fingerprints, better known as live scan. With that said, could we do things the old-fashioned way, the way we used to do in the 70s and 80s? We could, but it won't be nearly as efficient. It also would tend to lead to certain expectations, or at least lack of expectations. Uh, what happens is that the average taxpayer has seen every cop show twice. They've at least seen every forensic and investigative show a couple of times. And they expect police departments to have a certain level of technology. Now with that said, many of your colleagues in this program, both in the recent past and, and currently today, got into this program because they were they were given the perception that policing is not a field that is that has been relatively, or, or, or rather, it is a field that is relatively untouched by technology. Well, they couldn't be more wrong. Even the even the operational level police officer working the working the beat has to understand how to use a computer. If they don't they're at a significant disadvantage. In fact, they might as well consider another line of work. So with that, with that brief introduction, rather, we know that computers, technology, and modern criminalistics have revolutionized policing. We are now to the point where we have no choice but to adapt. And of course, Many cases have been solved as a result of forensics and criminalistics. Our author talks about the Beltway Sniper being one of those. It was actually broken through the use of investigative work and ballistics, but that's another story for another day. And so policing is adapting to new technology. They really don't have a choice. They have to adapt to new technology. It's here, it's going to continue to, to come here, and the public generally expects it. With that said, let's take a look at some, some forms of computer technology and policing and how it may appear. One such method is through computer-aided dispatch. Computer-aided dispatch is essentially a database of calls for service. What happens with computer-aided dispatch is that once a call arrives at the, at the 911 center, or let's let's use a, a relatively close example. Let's look at CCAO. CCAO is better known as the South Southeast or the Southern Arizona Emergency Communications System, currently located in Sierra Vista and basically handles law enforcement, fire, and EMS communications for Southeast Arizona. Once a call is received, a call taker will take the information, will we'll type in information on a keyboard, 
that information is then routed to a radio operator who will dispatch the appropriate units. This is way different than how it used to be. You might see in the old Atom 12 opening clips, you'll see a car that runs along tracks. And the way that works in the old days is that, a, is that an operator would write information on a car, send it on a moving track to a radio room who in, who in turn would dispatch the appropriate car. It's not like that anymore. It's to the point now where computer-aided dispatch is not is not a question of if but when, and there are price point there's there are CAD systems out there for every price point, including free. And of course, there's enhanced uh, computer-aided dispatch, which includes enhanced 911. This particular service allows information to be stored based upon caller name and caller address. And this information can be immediately ported to a, a mobile, I'm sorry, mobile digital terminal or, or in current computer, better known as an MDT or a MODAT. There's a lot of different names and, and it basically depends on the agency. Cell phone technology is also part of computer assisted technology. In a number of jurisdictions, a cell phone, the moment they dial 911, automatically provides the cell phone's approximate location. And this location is also ported to a mobile data terminal as well as being kept at dispatch. As a result of cell phones being almost used in, in place of a landline. Cell phone search warrants have become more and more necessary. With that, cell phone search warrants, or, or rather cell phone pinging as it's known, is used to locate people under certain emergent conditions. And these are usually very much restricted. The idea is, is to get the cell phone to provide its approximate GPS location so that the police can, can narrow down a search focus. One of the problems that has occurred with computer-aided dispatch is IP telephone, better known as Internet Protocol Telephone. And it also goes by the name of Voice Over Internet Protocol, or VOIP. You probably know this by by easier names such as cable television telephone service or magic jack or vonage or there's there's literally hosts of these particular voice over ip uh, telephone services are out there at various price points and the idea behind it is is that it uses the internet to route phone calls and can do it cheaper than, than what is known as POTS, plain old telephone system. The problem becomes getting a location. When you use voice over internet protocol, you're, you're often required to provide a physical location for the telephone. And this is because that many of these voice over IP providers often by telephone numbers in bulk and they these telephone numbers may not necessarily match the location for example magic jack has no telephone numbers for sale in the Sierra vista area the nearest one is going to be either casa grande or tucson and so if a user did not register his number properly then he would you would probably be using the, or sending the Casa Grande to pol police to a location which really should be in Sierra Vista. There are also automated databases. The granddaddy of them all when it comes to law enforcement is the NCIC, National Crime Information Center. Local departments may keep their own database, and this is especially true when there are database 
providers for law enforcement or RMS, record management systems for law enforcement, and all, all kinds of price points, including free. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the, as I mentioned, the granddaddy of all criminal justice databases, NCIC, better known as the National Crime Information Center. It's recently undergone a rather major change, and this is known as NCIC 2000. So coming up next, we're going to take a look at how NCIC 2000 works at the Indiana State Police. In January 1967, three years of effort, spearheaded by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, culminated with the activation of the National Crime Information Center, NCIC. In its infant stage, NCIC became operational with 15 agencies at the state and local level, forming the beginning of a national network. During the first month of operation, NCIC provided five files with 312,000 records and averaged less than 7,000 transactions per day. 24 years later, NCIC provides access to more than 60,000 criminal justice agency components throughout the United States. The NCIC hot files contain more than 8 million records concerning wanted and missing persons, stolen vehicles, and other stolen property. Through the NCIC interface with the Interstate Identification Index, more than 14 million criminal history records are available from 21 participating states and the FBI. While national telecommunications and databases were a novelty for the criminal justice community in 1967, NCIC is now an integral part of daily life for every criminal justice professional. NCIC routinely handles more than 1 million inquiries each day, with over 99% handled in less than 2 seconds. The NCIC system effectively extends the long arm of the law. By using NCIC, criminal justice agencies in each state, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands share their information with all other criminal justice agencies 24 hours a day, every day of the year. A recently completed study found that during one year, the NCIC system provided law enforcement agencies with information that led to the apprehension of approximately 136,000 wanted persons, the location of 36,000 missing juveniles, and the recovery of 170,000 vehicles worth more than $1 billion. A conservative estimate has shown that the NCIC system returns $4 for every dollar invested by the governmental partners at the federal, state, and local levels. This does not include a variety of other benefits, such as protection of citizen and law enforcement lives, reduced crime, and loss avoidance, just to name a few. The NCIC system is an excellent example of what can be achieved through cooperation. The FBI provides a central host computer at FBI headquarters and high-speed telecommunication lines to computers in each state, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. The FBI also funds the national network and provides management services to coordinate national policy and system management. Each state provides computer interface and a telecommunications network linking police departments, prosecutors' offices, sheriff's departments, and other criminal justice agencies throughout the state. Each state is responsible for its computer equipment network costs within its boundaries, with information exchanged between states without charge. Management of the system is shared between the FBI and state and local participants. Four regional working groups meet biannually to provide technical and policy recommendations for consideration by the NCIC Advisory Policy Board. Each state, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and each major federal agency has a representative on a regional working group. Six representatives from local criminal justice agencies are elected by their peers to serve on each regional working group. The Advisory Policy Board 
composed of 30 senior level representatives from criminal justice agencies throughout the United States, meets biannually to assist the FBI in development of the philosophy, concept, and operational procedures of NCIC. The board includes 20 elected members, six members appointed by the director of the FBI from the judiciary, prosecutory, and correctional sectors, and members selected by the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the National Sheriff's Association, the National District Attorney's Association, and the American Probation and Parole Association. Since NCIC is so successful, why is the federal government planning to spend $77 million for NCIC 2000 and requesting the states to make varying levels of financial commitment to a new system? The simple answer is that NCIC is becoming technically obsolete. Much of the software for the system was written in the 1960s and is first-generation machine language. Thousands of enhancements have been made, each one piggybacked on the original code. The result is a system that is overly complicated, hard to maintain, and even harder to adapt to current needs. Because of these deficiencies, NCIC does not provide the type of service that the criminal justice community needs and deserves. Additional services must be provided, security must be enhanced, and data quality must be improved. The criminal justice community must take advantage of the technological opportunities that exist to improve our effectiveness, while at the same time ensuring that we protect the civil and constitutional rights of the public. What then is NCIC 2000, and how was it designed? NCIC 2000 required a major commitment by the FBI and key elements of the entire criminal justice community. The first phase of the rebuilding process began in January 1986, when the FBI launched a two-year, $4 million study known as NCIC 2000 to design, develop, and implement the new generation of NCIC. The object of the study, conducted by the MIGER Corporation, a nonprofit governmental research arm, was to design a system that would support the criminal justice community into the next century. MITRE was tasked with building a high-performance system that would provide improved functional, analytic, and predictive capabilities. The MITRE study began with interviews of over 500 experienced criminal justice officials at the federal, state, and local levels. These interviews were followed by a survey of more than 2,500 criminal justice agencies concerning their information needs. Perhaps the most interesting and unusual aspect of the MITRE study was an analysis of the future operating environment of the criminal justice community. A future study was conducted regarding law enforcement needs in our future world. Thereafter, during a three-day session, top criminal justice professionals participated in a conference to arrive at a consensus prediction of their NCIC needs through the year 2000. The MITRE study process confirmed the need for all current NCIC functions and develop several hundred potential requirements or concepts. These concepts were submitted to the Advisory Policy Board for review to ensure that only those concepts that would be beneficial across the entire criminal justice spectrum and were acceptable in terms of civil and constitutional guarantees would be included in the new NCIC system. Operational, technical, and fiscal feasibility were also addressed. Over a year, the Advisory Policy Board and various subcommittees refined and reduced the original concepts to key issues that would serve to bring NCIC through the year 2000. The far-reaching civil and constitutional rights implications of a national data system were addressed throughout the study process. The FBI, MITRE, and the Board worked closely with congressional oversight committees in particular, the House Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights, chaired by Representative Don Edwards of California. The new NCIC will represent a multi-generational advance in technology. Rather than using the assembler language of the 1960s, NCIC will employ fourth-generation computer language. A relational database management system will be employed, providing more efficient records management and utilization. Pattern analysis and recognition will be employed, 
enhancing data quality and security. A state-of-the-art workstation will be available, providing users with interactive computer training and innovative on-site quality control and security features. NCIC 2000 will retain all current NCIC functions, as well as provide a number of significant enhancements. The most exciting and visible change will provide criminal justice agencies with the ability to enter photographic images in NCIC records and to utilize automatic fingerprint comparison technology to positively identify an individual. The FBI has successfully demonstrated, as a part of NCIC 2000 prototyping, the ability to transmit fingerprint and photographic images from NCIC to a patrol car on the street within seconds. This capability has a dual benefit. It will improve the ability of law enforcement to identify and apprehend fugitives, while at the same time eliminating those individuals who may be the subject of misidentification because of the similarity of names and identical numerical identifiers such as date of birth. NCIC 2000 will provide a file to allow federal and state agencies to enter their parolees and probationers. The file will be designed to assist the entering agencies to meet their responsibilities to ensure that probationers and parolees comply with the conditions imposed by the courts at the time of the release. The file will also provide online access to federal corrections data. An automated link with the Canadian Police Information Center, the Canadian equivalent of NCIC, has been approved. This will provide law enforcement agencies on both sides of the border with up-to-date information on wanted persons, stolen vehicles, and other data vital to officer safety and effective enforcement. Artificial intelligence will be used to improve record quality and security. Each record entered in NCIC will be reviewed by the computer in relation to the entire database to determine errors and potential errors. Artificial intelligence will also be used to improve security, identifying a significant abnormality in message traffic by a particular agency or user. Both NCIC and the State Control Terminal Agency will be notified of a possible security violation. Enhanced computer searching techniques will also be used. These techniques will include improved name searches designed to eliminate the missed matches that now occur. A delayed inquiry program will be automated, allowing the FBI to notify criminal justice agencies that the subject of their NCIC entry was inquired upon during the three days immediately prior to entry of the record in NCIC. Both of these programs should be of substantial benefit in the location of fugitives and the recovery of property. The second phase of the NCIC 2000 project is the actual building of the system. The United States Congress has recently authorized, through multi-year funding, $77 million to build NCIC 2000. As the FBI implements NCIC 2000, other federal, state, and local systems will require significant upgrading of their telecommunications networks, hardware, and software. What can the federal, state, and local agencies expect to get for their investment? Three major benefits will accrue to all users of the system. First, criminal justice effectiveness will be improved. Second, and most importantly, officer safety will be enhanced. Thirdly, the likelihood of civil suit will be reduced. NCIC 2000 represents a major improvement in technology as well as a significant increase in capability. It presents the criminal justice community with the opportunity to build on a proven, successful system. NCIC has been of invaluable assistance over its 24-year life, and the new NCIC must incorporate all of the best technology that is expected to become available. And that pretty much wraps up uh, NCIC. Now, when you're comparing NCIC to a local record management system, both do the same job. But what a local management system does that allows 
intelligence level information to be shared amongst other agencies. And this is something that the NCIC doesn't have. It is, it can be analogized to a large filing cabinet. It has information about, about people and articles and so forth, but that combined with RMS is, is a very effective combination when dealing with information management and criminal justice. With that said, it's not so much the technology, but it's the information, getting, getting information in the right place at the right time. Coming up next, we're going to look at crime mapping. One of the parts of evidence-based policing is the use of crime mapping. And in the old days, crime mapping used to consist of a map put on a wall with various crime locations denoted in thumbtacks. What computers have done for the old pin map, they've essentially made that part of a computer-assisted database. And so this computer database allows us to determine where hotspots are and allows administration to de deploy its, its forces most effectively. And it looks like this video is no longer available, so we're going to we're going to move along with that. Now what crime mapping allows you to do, as I mentioned before, it allows you to determine where the hotspots are, where is the most crime. One of the things that we found out through conducting research and and studies is that Roughly 90% of your crime occurs in approximately 10% of your locations. And so by concentrating your, your resources in those locations, you're bound to reduce your, your crime impact. And of course, computer-assisted uh, case management is also utilized in a number of departments. And what it can do is it can provide a list of suspects based upon a computerized statistical analysis of, your, of crime in your area. The one thing it can't do is it can't replace an investigator. Some of the other things that computers are, are being used for in law enforcement is computer-assisted instruction. And there's a number of learning management systems that are currently being adopted by law enforcement. For example, the learning management system that we use at Cochise College, better known as Moodle, is actually being adapted by a number of law enforcement agencies throughout the nation. In fact, it is the current official learning management system for the state of Nevada uh, Law Enforcement uh, Training Center. And there's more research being done into virtual simulators we're currently doing. Uh, some research in virtual police simulated training at this college with uh, the Southeast Arizona Law Enforcement Training Academy. Of course, in administration, we've already talked about management information or record management systems. Uh, they're also being used for jail and prisoner management and for patrol allocation. They're also used to track officer misconduct. If the computer determines that an officer's level of misconduct is a deviation from the norm. That officer would be identified by the computer and additional monitoring may take place by law enforcement. Some additional uses, of course, are uh, computer-assisted communication between cars, between officers, and so forth. In Europe, there's even a handheld computer that that law enforcement can use to communicate with each other, although that hasn't quite caught on yet in the United States. Mobile technology, another form of mobile technology that is computer assisted is the use of law of license plate recognition technology. Now some people believe that there's there's some privacy issues involved, but keep in mind if you can drive down the road and see what what 
a person's license plate number is, so can an LPR. So with that, let's take a look and see how the Houston Police Department is currently utilizing LPRs or license plate rec recognition technology. Hello, my name is Charlie Starks of the Houston Police Department. I would like to take a few moments of your time to show you some of the high-tech equipment that our department has installed on some of our vehicles to help catch auto thieves. The equipment is called Automated License Plate Recognition Devices, or ALPR for short, and it uses specially designed cameras that are mounted on the police vehicle to read license plates to other vehicles. One of the best features of this technology is that it is automatic and while driven on routine patrol. When the camera detects a stolen vehicle or wanted vehicle, in less than a second, the system will alert the officer driving the police vehicle. Another interesting feature is that the cameras use color and infrared technology to not only read license plates during the day, but at night in low light conditions. Each ALPR vehicle has an onboard computer processing unit that processes plates read from the cameras and compares it with stored plate data in the computer to determine if the plate is from a stolen vehicle, a wanted vehicle, or a vehicle with municipal warrants associated with it. The ALPR device uses the same computer screen that the officer uses to receive calls from dispatch, and the system can operate in the background while the officer is using the computer to communicate with dispatch. The cameras will automatically read plates of vehicles driving toward and away from the police vehicle. The system is really good at checking parked vehicles. We just got a hit on a stolen vehicle on that abandoned black Ford Fusion. Every patrol station citywide has an ALPR vehicle with this high-tech equipment to seek out stolen and wanted vehicles. The technology is a force multiplier and automatically checks vehicle license plates while the officer is on patrol. And so that's an ALPR, Automated License Plate Recognition Technology. So with that, let's shift our focus to another form of technology, and that is fingerprint technology. As many of you may already know, fingerprints are as, are as unique to each person as practically any other feature, including DNA. While individual, or rather identical twins, may share the same DNA, they don't share the same fingerprint. Now, fingerprints can be taken any one of the different ways for any one of the different reasons. Many agencies use live scan, others continue to use ink and so forth. And fingerprints may be required for things such as background checks or to gain entrance into the police academy as a as a uh, open enrollment student. They can be left on a crime scene, so they're very useful in law enforcement. Once you get that fingerprint, though, back in the not too uh, not too recent past, it was difficult at best to determine whose fingerprint they were because we were relying mostly on manual file searches, and it generally took about several weeks to months before we could find out using a manual file search who this person is. APHIS, however, cuts that down to minutes and sometimes even seconds depending on who, who inputs the information if it's inputted correctly. So with that, let's take a look at APHIS. In this particular circumstance, we're going to take a look at the APHA system available at the Seattle, Washington Police Department.
amazingly unique. No two people in the world have exactly the same placement of ridge details, even identical twins. And prints are permanent, unless altered through scarring. Fingerprints stay the same from birth through death. They are the key to a person's identity. This is where APHIS comes in, the Regional Automated Fingerprint Identification System, a database of more than 600,000 print records from all of the region's police agencies, with more coming in every day. Quality of prints, uh, we want to make sure we get the best quality possible. Each of King County's regional detention facilities relies on a special team of ID techs to record the prints. So if every inmate that comes in, we, they need to be fingerprinted and photographed. Only 24-7, of course. Um, they usually need four to five people on a shift. An electronic live scan has replaced the old, outdated beat print system. Information is now uploaded in moments instead of days. So a live scan is, is simply a computer with a glass platen. We roll the fingerprints um, to the glass platen, and the prints are electronically submitted to our APHIS database. APHIS uses the unique arrangement of ridge characteristics on the print to compare them to the thousands of others on file. The computer produces a list of possible matches within minutes. Uh, maybe the short ridge that kind of splits into that sort of put a little bit like a wrench. I see it. that same feature there. The computer may narrow down the search, but it's a trained 10 print examiner that carefully compares them and determines a match. We have to be absolutely certain because a person's life could be riding on the decision we make as to their identity. A very short ridge there. Same thing there. So uh, it's a hit. We can get a response back to the operator, the um, life scan operator, within minutes in a lot of cases. Fast information that can be critical to an officer on the street or to a jail intake center. You know, so we fingerprint someone and he comes back as a convicted felon who is known to assault officers, you know, that helps these guys out so they can, you know, watch them accordingly and handle them accordingly also. The 10 print unit cross-checks the information with the courts and prosecutor's office, including any new aliases before sending it to the State Patrol and FBI. What we're trying to do is make sure all the information is correct um, on our business on the sheet um, before we go ahead and send it off to the state to uh, look at the information and update the uh, it's that kind of information that officers like Patrolman Brendan Heron rely on every day. In the spring of 2009, he and his team arrested one 22-year-old Terrell Yarborough in Tecmula. He gave us several different names, several different dates of birth, which we called out the man gang. Yarborough's prints were sent to APHIS. Examiner Eva Hess was working the swing shift. She couldn't match the prints to anyone in the regional detail. So we always go to Exasec and fax to FBI to make sure that we're covering our bases. A while later, we got a phone call from APHIS that uh, who he really was and the fact that he had a homicide warrant out of Detroit. They got a hit and found out um, he was wanted for homicide and um, murder and attempted murder, armed robbery and home invasion. I believe our department got a phone call Soon after that, from the homicide investigator in Detroit, uh, couldn't believe that this guy was in custody and said, under no conditions could you let him go. So uh, they were very excited that we caught him. The ability to quickly verify someone's identity with fingerprints and share that information, that's what makes the difference. You know, if somebody's lying about who they are, you know, our unit is, is, is pretty good at, at, at identifying them and then whoever, whatever agency you need to know. I've been doing this for almost 25 years, and back in the day when you had to dig through cards or, or, you know, just assume a person was who they said they were, you know, it made your job very, very difficult. Um, you used to have to take fingerprints, mail them off to the FBI, get them back, and then you get your hit. You know, three weeks later, that, that does you no good. But not all new prints find a match. If the prints don't match any records in the database, they're given a new APIS number paired with more than 30,000 unidentified prints from unsolved crimes. By checking each new arrest against the database, examiners often identify suspects in many unsolved crimes. ID techs, 
and 10 print examiners also help identify patients at Harborview Medical Center by fingerprinting them and searching the prints for relatives. And they work with the medical examiner's office to identify deceased persons. We handle not only King County Sheriff's Office and its contact cities fingerprint work, but also Seattle Police Department. So that was a somewhat brief uh, presentation in, into automated fingerprint identification systems. But one of the things that you may or may not have noticed is that is that not just fingerprints are being scanned and and searched, but also palm prints are being scanned and searched as well. Not every agency has that capability. It's, for lack of a better term, an extra cost option. But one of the things that really, that police departments are always looking for is different ways to incapacitate people who are resisting arrest. And this has probably been one of the driving forces of, of technology. We're trying to get to the point where we have the, the Star Trek phaser. This is where we're at so far. When it comes to crime fighting, cops increasingly have to tackle violent criminals. suspects under control. Every day, police have to deal with criminals prepared to arm themselves with guns. To bring them under control without resorting to guns themselves, the police are increasingly relying on a new generation of less lethal weapons. Meet Sergeant Kevin Orkut. Here in Thornton, Colorado, Kevin is responsible for developing a non-lethal close quarters weapon known as the OPN. So if we go ahead and get control here, like the kind of control, and I'm going to come in here, get control here, down, 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 down. What we want to do is gain control of these individuals without having to use a lot of impact or a lot of tactics that might exist. We want that low profile. The OPN has been adopted by over 200 law enforcement agencies in the states and is designed for control during arrest or self-defense against an unarmed attacker. It's specially designed so that, unlike its Chinese cousin, it won't be breaking any bones. It's a plastic version, a polycarbonate version, has a brick surface, a uh, nylon cord that stretches and gives, and the, uh, the plastic part's actually thin. Okay? Come with me, sir. Come with me. The OPN is a significant advance on the truncheon, but is only suitable for use with an unarmed criminal. For dealing with armed assailants, the police are turning to another technology. San Diego, they produce a weapon which can disable people using pepper. Pepper works by attacking the mucous membranes in the throat, nose, and eyes, causing discomfort and confusion. It's long been used in the form of a spray, but the problem with pepper spray is that you have to get close to the suspect. The answer is specially developed pepper balls. These are filled with parva an extremely hot pepper derivative. It's the molecules called capsaicin in peppers that give them their heat, and parva is made from capsaicin too, the hottest of all. This is produced chemically to ensure it's consistent. The next problem is creating the outer shell. It has to, uh, upon launch, accelerate very quickly, up to 300 feet per second, without breaking, but then when it strikes somebody, it has to burst upon impact. And that's the tricky part. These pepper balls can be delivered by a variety of special guns. The SA-200 semi-automatic carbine is accurate to 60 feet. Then there's the TAC-700, capable of delivering up to 700 rounds per minute. That's 12 every second. As part of their training with these weapons, every officer has to experience being shot with the pepper balls. We also have purple rounds that are filled with an inert powder, and these are used for training. Law enforcement fires them at each other. They feel the effect of the round. As well as the purple rounds, green rounds are filled with a special type of dye. It's for marking, particularly violence. 
violent or uncooperative uh, suspects during a riot. And this way, law enforcement can round them up uh, later. So how do these pepper balls work in practice? Hey, pal. Come on, what's the problem here? Hey, cop! The highly accurate pepper ball gun allows police to tackle a violent criminal from a safe distance. Put it down! When the criminal refuses to follow instructions, the officer shoots a blast of pepper balls at his chest, which explode on impact. <coughs> Seconds later, the criminal's eyes, nose and throat begin to burn, making it hard for him to see and breathe in difficulty. <coughs> Fortunately, because the capsaicin too is the same as that found in nature, it can be metabolized by the body, so it doesn't do any permanent damage. But if you need to stop an assailant instantaneously, there's one more device in the armory drawer. Named after a science fiction character called Tom Swift, this is the Taser, an acronym for Thomas A. Swift's electric rifle. There are two versions. The M26 for the military, and this one for the police. It's the uh, Taser International M26 Taser. The Taser works by sending a pulse of electricity across a pair of metal prongs, which disrupt nerve and muscle function. It will uh, deliver 50,000 volts downrange to the target individual, causing the muscles to cramp up. And uh, therefore, the person should not be able to apply this anymore, and he'll be able to take more custody. With a maximum range of 10 meters, it uses a dart that can penetrate two inches of clothing and is even effective on someone wearing body armor. We don't have to worry about, you know, uh, chemicals in the eyes. We don't have to worry about the bruising from the impact conditions. So it's been a godsend for us. Thanks to this new generation of non-lethal weapons, the police have some formidable new tools in their fight against armed criminals. Put it down! That's the point! However, we still haven't reached the point where we can equip every police officer with a Star Trek-style taser. With that said, Less than lethal weapons, while everybody wants every police officer to have one, we have yet to reach the point where they're, they can be a reliable substitute for lethal force all the time. Having said that, it is an addition, not a replacement, for the firearm. With that said, there's... There are court cases that address that, although that's outside really the scope of this of this class. Some additional technological advances, of course, are surveillance technology. Uh, vehicle tracking systems and surveillance vans are two such examples of that technology. Uh, with surveillance, your checkbook is really your object, or, or really your limit. However, with the right kind of creativity, and the right sort of the right sort of people you could or any any department could equip a surveillance van that's as good as anything that the federal government has for a lot less money vehicle tracking systems is a little bit different these also well these also come in various price points it depends largely on whether or not this is a real-time tracker or whether this is going to be a what we'd like to call a set and retrieve, where someone places the tracker and then retrieves it at a later time. Both devices do use global positioning or GPS systems, and periodically what it'll do is it'll take the GPS location and either store it to memory or transmit it over cellular frequencies to a receiver at a different location. And this sort of technology makes following a car a, a much more successful alternative. Night vision devices have been around since just prior to the Vietnam War, but what has really made them available to law enforcement has been the recent uh, Persian Gulf Wars and 
and Middle East wars. As a result, the technology is really advanced and has actually gotten cheaper. Some of this technology is actually made available to law enforcement. Now, with that said, the latest technology is thermal imaging. Thermal imaging was developed again out of, out of the Gulf War, and the idea was to allow American uh, tank crews to see uh, Iraqi and, and other opposing tank forces during a sandstorm. And it, it works really well, however, there are certain uh, legal constraints. For in other words, you can't, you can't aim it at a house because the courts have ruled in Kylo versus U.S. that you just can't do that without a search warrant. GPS we've already talked about already. Surveillance aircraft is really starting to take off, if you'll pardon the expression. Surveillance aircraft has been used probably about as long as the aircraft is, has been invented. But what's really showing a lot of promise in the, at this moment in time is the use of drones. Drones or unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles are bringing down the cost of aircraft surveillance quite markedly. However, from a legal perspective, it's still relatively limited. While it's perfectly legal for anybody to order a radio-controlled drone out of a, off the internet and have it delivered to their house, for for people who are not your average hobbyist or people such as government, business, and so forth, it requires a lot more licensing hurdles to overcome. And so we're probably we're probably gonna have to wait and see about some about legal constraints before we really see agencies using this technology on a widespread basis. There's definitely a lot of promise to that. Electronic video surveillance. This is this is really involving the use of hidden cameras, and we we've been using these for practically as long as the camera's been built. If they're placed in a in a public area or an area that's publicly accessible, there is no expectation of privacy, and it's not difficult at all to use them and enter the evidence into court. Other forms of surveillance technology, of course, involve cell phone technology and cell phone searches. Generally speaking, all these items that are listed in this slide here, and I'm not going to ask you to recite every one, they all require a search warrant, with the exception of an E911 ping. A ping can be initiated if, there, if there's probable cause to believe that the, that the subscriber may be in danger. And if that's the case, then the telephone can be pinged and the, and the telephone's location could be provided to law enforcement. But that's like everything else. If you misuse the technology, you're going to lose it. Digital photography is is where we're going in when it comes to forensic or law enforcement imaging these days. If you ha need to be convinced of that, go down to your local drugstore and try to find 35 millimeter film. You're generally not going to find it. Uh, there, while our authors claim that there are problems with, with photo manipulation and courts requiring original evidence, there are, there are ways in which this information can be utilized in court, but it's outside the scope of this class. Aerial photography, again, can be co combined with drones, but, then it, but to have an agency use it requires a certain amount of licensing. And so we're not going to see that utilized anytime soon. Lastly, we'll talk about mugshots and how mugshot imaging is used. Uh, they're oftentimes used to in with visual recognition systems and sometimes with age progression. 
Now, coming up next, we're going to be talking about about a new technology that brings that brings the artistry of composites to the average officer. I want to thank everyone for taking their time to come here and as we talk about a new program for our police department and something we're also going to introduce to our students at both Alvin and Mandel High Schools. I want to thank Charlie Davis, who is the founder of the Charlie Davis Group, a consulting firm that identifies career and personal needs of retired professional athletes. Mr. Davis played for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the early days of the Steel Curtain, as well as St. Louis Cardinals and the Houston Oilers. We have this opportunity today because Mr. Davis has partnered with IQ Biometrics and FACES to bring local law enforcement agencies software designed to build face composites to help law enforcement agencies identify criminal suspects and more quickly apprehend those who commit crimes. It was started in the University of Montreal. They hand drew 3,000 images to create the software. It's been on a lot of TV shows. America's Most Wanted, it was on CSI in Miami, I believe. John Walsh from America's Most Wanted became the spokesman about 10 years ago. And FACES is the leading software. Well, we're going to deploy the software to our supervisors, to our investigators, and to our division commanders. We will have it both uh, in our vehicles and um, desktops here in headquarters. It's really going to be a, a big benefit to all of us here at the department. Sit in the car with what is fresh on the, on the victim's mind or the witness's mind and draw the pictures right here from the car. The squad car can email it to Channel 13 and can get up within minutes. I think it's going to be a great program for us. I will be using it in my investigations. I did have a software that is basically the same, but I can't figure out how to use it. This is so easy. The Alvin ISD Police Department, in partnership with Mr. Davis and the folks from FACES ID, are teaming up with our students to put this software in our classrooms. At Alvin High School, we will place this crime-fighting software in our forensic sciences class. At Manville High School, we will place this software in our health sciences class. The challenge that we have is that within law enforcement and within the educational community, uh, it's very difficult to find the funding for something like this. We came up with what we call the Anti-Crime Awareness Initiative, and Charlie and I really started this thing about nine months ago. Charlie has uh, stepped forward, and he's helped find the money to uh, give this donation to us, so let's all welcome Charlie. This software will put out of schools online with the most high-tech systems anywhere in the country. And uh, it, it's just an honor for me to be here and, and present this to you. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to me to present you with the uh, latest edition of the FACES IQ software. As an instructor, make sure that uh, the kids get on. <laughs> we have a CSI shows, and they've become very popular, so kids are very, very interested in what's going on in the forensic science world. Forensic anthropology is one of the things our kids will be studying in classrooms, and this will help them identify genetic traits, facial characteristics, and people. We just got the program, but from what we've used it so far, they have loved it. I like how you can actually come up with people's faces, expressions. I think that you know it will help the police department a lot in the future. Uh, I hope to see it put to work, and I like using it. So I think it's a great software to have and use. So when this is in y'all's classrooms, you can see somebody rob a gas station one day and go sit at your computer and build a space up. I think it's wonderful. Kids want to see uh, more technology in the classroom. That's when they get motivated and engaged in, in the lessons. So it's a win-win for all of us. It's a great learning experience because then you get to learn different pictures from different different places, and it makes you um, visualize more. Of course, you had a great subject to work on. <laughs> what I see is the progress that you made in the subject. So I think anytime we can introduce technology that makes our jobs easier, it's a win-win for not only the law enforcement agency, but for the communities they serve. We're going to uh, give each one of you guys today a set of the software. How about that? 
we're pleased to be one of the first departments to get the software to utilize in this way. Not only uh, as a law enforcement tool, but also as an education tool. Now, the FACES software is nothing new. It originally came out of what we used to call the Identikit, which is this, a series of clear overlays which had various eyes, nose, and so forth. But it often required a specially trained operator to use it at least, I wouldn't say well, but I would say uh, competently. And operators were not always easy to find. In my last department I worked at, for example, we had one operator working in five different counties at the same time. Now, I was fortunate enough to be part of uh, the FACES software's uh, introduction way back in the in the in the uh, 90s, as I was chosen to be one of their uh, one of their beta testers for the software. And it's improved quite a bit since then. It doesn't require nearly as much training to make it work. The nice thing about it is this composite software can be utilized or at least scanned into a facial recognition database. <clears throat> and we're just beginning to see some of the benefits from facial recognition in, in uh, the Homeland Security realm. And By having, by having this software and having the ability to, to develop these composites pretty much on scene, you ended up with an image that can, that can be loaded into a facial recognition database and have an identity for that face in a relatively short period of time. Now, as you probably have guessed, there's, there's what we call forensics or criminalistics. And this is this should not be confused with criminology. Criminalistics and forensic science are pretty much uh, the same thing or they're analogous to each other. And the idea is, is that it uses science to determine an answer to a legal question. Now, the problem with, this, with the CSI effect is that most of the time, when you see these portrayals on television, they're not realistic at all. And you end up with a very romantic impression of, of forensic science. In fact, my job from 2012 to about 2015 was strictly due to the CSI effect. We had a lot of people in the Miami area, of course, that's where one of these, one of these uh, crime shows took place. The dirty little secret is, is that none of it was filmed in Miami. But we ended up with a lot of students wanting to take forensic science. And as a result, the classes became filled for a while. But students got the wrong idea. They thought it was a bunch of pretty people running around in designer clothes, looking cool, and solving crime. It wasn't. It's a very dirty job. It can be a very rewarding job, but it's still a very dirty job. And it requires a lot of science, which many of these students weren't willing to do. Now, the modern crime lab, it may depend, of course, on your funding, but you often find various things such as fingerprints, impression evidence, ballistics, serology, and so forth. Labs have to be... a have to be accredited in most jurisdictions, and it's usually ASCLAD, American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors, who are doing the accrediting. While it is voluntary, as I mentioned before, generally speaking, most labs will not get funded unless they're either working toward or are accredited through ASCLAD. One of the up-and-coming disciplines, of course, is computer and digital forensics, and that this takes in a whole host of things which, quite frankly, are outside of the scope of this course. But basically, as computers are used as instrumentalities in crime, the forensic community has responded by, by being able to 
gather evidence from these instrumentalities. Moving on to DNA, DNA is used and is oftentimes extracted a lot in in uh, various crime labs. It, it, DNA is basically individual to every person. Every person has their own DNA. Uh, the only duplicate, of course, is with identical twins. And there's a number of there's a number of of uh, methods and means to obtain those DNA profiles. But the DNA profiles are largely loaded into CODIS, and in turn, they're searched against other profiles to determine if there is a match in the system. If there isn't, then chances are it's going to be logged into an unidentified database and it awaits someone else being put into that database to match it. Now, of course, it's not without certain issues, one of which is, is the backlog. There's so much DNA being collected, it, a lot of the times it ends up sitting. One particular case involved a, a uh, closed and abandoned school that was being repurposed as a DNA evidence lab by the Detroit Police Department. Unbeknownst to them, <clears throat> the school was scheduled for demolition, and it was basically forgotten. And so the demolition crew found a bunch of uh, DNA kits that were just sitting there awaiting collection. So that caused a small scandal and resulted in a lot of federal money being freed up to eliminate the DNA backlog. Familial DNA searches are, <clears throat> are another issue, uh, especially with the, with the uh, public DNA kits that are available for about 100 bucks, you can get your own profile done. And <clears throat> that's currently a, a area of development in legal, uh, in, uh, or rather in uh, law. And the courts are just beginning to deal with that issue as we speak. And of course, it has been used in the Innocence Project to exonerate people and sometimes to keep them inside. One of the other forms of advanced technology is biometric identification. And biometric identification, when, you're, when you hear that term being used, it has to do with certain measurable biological characteristics used to gain someone's identity. And they could be any one of a number of things. Much of this is still in development. A lot of it is not in common use. Of the two that are, fingerprints and iris-based systems are commonly used by, by the United States government. Others, again, are either in development or in low-scale usage. Some of the other advanced technology that we're seeing now is things such as cameras and robots. NCARC video started this trend and it later graduated to body-worn video. The idea of which is that is that this information is a disinterested observer. And so if video says one thing and, and someone testifies to something else, who are we going to believe? And it basically comes down to, to the video evidence. Research has shown that more people are more likely to be convicted when video evidence is involved than any other form of evidence except for forensic science. And we also have robotics. Robotics is largely an outgrowth of military technology. And it's been utilized for law enforcement. Bomb robots are, of course, the obvious choice. While they're still relatively expensive, there are ways where bombs, bomb robots rather, can be obtained by local law enforcement. And these robots are also used for various other uh, tactical delivery devices. They can be used for remote communication and remote surveillance through the use of cameras and other technology. But with that comes our final segment, and that is 
how do we get all of this in the hands of the average police department? new helicopter would be in upwards of four to six million dollars and these helicopters that we get are at no cost the humvee is worth forty thousand dollars we're just over three and a half million dollars that we've received in benefits from this program we've been able to transfer about 11.2 million dollars in equipment to uh, our law enforcement agencies Disposition Services is a primary level field activity of DLA. We are responsible for the program management and oversight of the Law Enforcement Support Office. The LESO program provides the opportunity for DOD excess property to be utilized to meet the individual equipment and property needs for law enforcement agencies throughout the United States and U.S. territories. thing that our officers use are boots, uh, some uniforms, uh, vehicles. We branched out to more uh, bigger vehicles. As you can see, this 350 was one of our newest acquisitions. Because of the fact that Maine is a very rural and very rugged state, the Humvees that we've acquired are used by our Rangers during their law enforcement missions. In fiscal year 2011, the state of Arizona acquired almost $15 million in property from the Department of Defense. Shredders, ice machines, pickup trucks, pens, papers, three ring binders, coffee machines. We received the Casper vehicle, which is the armored vehicle. The benefit for the SWAT team and for our agency is that it fills gaps, um, whether it be budgetary gaps or just equipment that we're lacking or can't get in our hands. It's an OH 58C helicopter that was made in 1969, took some bullet holes and was repaired by the military. We had to Go through the records and convert them over a little bit from some of the military standards to the civilian standards. It's done countless numbers of rescues and drug operations here with Maricopa County. It's been a great helicopter. We've seen electronics come through the program, vehicles to be used for uh, off-road purposes such as Humvees, uh, 4x4s, so a variety of equipment that is desperately needed for our law enforcement uh, through this program. The lesser program is just the ability to, to get items that are more durable than may be available on the civilian market. For the Air Run Emergency Response Coalition, the LESO program is really the uh, reason we exist today. These helicopters that we get are at no cost. We then, uh, using donated grant funding and Department of Homeland Security money, are able to retrofit these. These helicopters are used for search and rescue to support fire and any number of law enforcement issues from finding lost children and uh, adults to finding and fleeing felons. Went to our state coordinator through the LESO program, we were able to obtain a Humvee. LESO has not only provided us with these aircraft, other vehicles, and things that just are extraordinary items that we would never be able to afford to purchase. By utilizing the LESO program, we've been able to pick up everything from blankets to these boats that are behind us, as well as trucks. We even have been able to pick up a dental chair. The sheriff is in charge of all rescues and recoveries in any given county in the state of Michigan. So our dive team for many years had utilized a boat that was a 1959 Aluma craft, very heavy boat, uh, antiquated, and the engines that would take to run that were not capable, and so we often had breakdowns. So we started searching on the LESO network looking for the right piece of equipment, and luckily we were able to find our 22-foot Boston Whaler.
condition of the property can either be new, unused, still in the manufacturer's packaging, and that can be for uh, various reasons. Either they had purchased too much, their admission needs have changed, or the property becomes obsolete and is replaced with new equipment. Other property can be worn or used and can be used for replacement parts. Uh, this is a military wrecker. This is a transport vehicle, and this is a communications vehicle. We receive these vehicles basically in the condition that they're in now, other than we put lighting and different markings on them for the sheriff's office. This is an up-armored Humvee, and it was in pretty rough shape when we got it, but it was still something that our, our agencies that use it now would never be able to purchase if it were new or even a replacement. So we've got, we, we pick this up for little money and ship it, basically. And then we were brought up to Northern Maine, where we have the Maine Military Authority, and they do refurbishing of, of vehicles like this. The Lesso office is split into two region teams. We have the Eastern team and the Western team. They each cover their respective states. We also have individuals that are what we call commodity leads, and they focus on high-profile visibility items um, to support law enforcement agency needs, such as aircraft, weapons, uh, tactical vehicles. The process to get into the, into the program is very simple. You just need to go to our website, find your appropriate state coordinator, and contact them. The Department of Defense does not charge the law enforcement offices. However, each state uh, may have administrative fees through their state coordinator. What I found is the program is easy to work with. The contacts that I've made uh, to obtain the equipment, it's an easy process. Many times after a disaster, the LESO program um, helps to support the states in an effort to clean up after a disaster such as Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was unique. We contacted the state coordinators in their affected areas. A recent Example of Hurricane Sandy, the law enforcement support office provided $1.6 million worth of uh, excess property in the form of generators, Humvees, and heavy equipment. There literally is no way possible that department our size, or the numerous departments in the area could afford assets such as these. It's an amazing program, and it's a realization of, of all of our tax dollars. Without a doubt, uh, without this program, we wouldn't be able to acquire these types of vehicles. Learn about it now. Contact your state coordinator now. Find out what's available, and find out how you go about applying for it, because it's only going to benefit your community, your agency, and yourself. And as you can see, technology is a wonderful thing, but if you can't afford that technology, then you're, you're pretty much stuck. You could be talking science fiction at that point. The law enforcement support office of the Defense Logistics Agency levels the playing field. It allows smaller agencies, and we all know how many of those smaller agencies really are, you might as well say the average police department, to obtain assets that they would not normally be able to get. Now, one of the things that I found out while, while working as the acquisition officer for our police department was that people were concerned about law enforcement uh, utilizing military equipment. People would often say that, that police shouldn't have military equipment. And much of it has to do with a lack of understanding. Now, Granted, there's many people that actually fear technology. They're afraid that, that we're going to end up in a situation that's akin to George Orwell's 1984, where Big Brother watches everything. And many times, citizens are afraid that that's what's going to happen with, law with military technology. 
the reality is it's not going to happen. For one, any any technology that could be easily abused is simply not going to get into the hands of law enforcement. Uh, usually that kind of equipment is prohibitively expensive and the military will want to hang on to it for as long as they can. Or the price tag is so big law enforcement is not going to get at it. With that said, privacy laws are always in a rapid state of development, especially as technology advances. So we're going to see we're going to see court cases come through the Supreme Court, and decisions will be made probably on either um, on a monthly basis or semi-annual basis. So this is going to continue to develop. With that said, to sum things up. Law enforcement will continue to use technology. It's been it's been in use for years. Some of it is less is less than legal weaponry, and we're going to continue to develop that technology because we have yet to develop the Star Trek phaser. Biometric data is, is also going to become very much a part of law enforcement, and but with all of this technology, and yes, it is important for law enforcement officers to understand it at all levels, it's still not going to replace people. And the same could be said for body, or body-worn video is a perfect example of that. Body-worn video was seen by many people as a technological uh, solution to the problem of hiring bad officers. But as research is showing us, Body worn video is not a substitute for, for the proper selection, training, and retention of, of people. It will always be a people business and will continue to be one in the foreseeable future. With that, this, bring, this brings us to the end of our discussion for the week. Uh, keep in mind that Thursday is, is a school recognized holiday. And of course, we're talking about the week of November 19th. 2018, Thursday is a recognized holiday. There will be no class or activities for that day. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, contact me through email or chat.